And good evening, everybody. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Rue Vandegrift of the University of Oregon, who's going to talk about the mushrooms of Ecuador. For those of you who know me, the country of Ecuador is near and dear to my heart. So several months ago, when my Ecuadorian girlfriend told me about the presentation about the mushrooms of said country, I was very eager to listen in. The first speaker from that event is tonight's lecturer. And for this presentation, Rue has graciously agreed to deliver it in English rather than the original Espanol. <laughs> Rue is a polyglot, a scientist, an illustrator, a professor, and he's currently producing the documentary film, Marrow of the Mountain, which discusses the threats to the fragile ecosystem in Reserva Los Cedros, which means the Cedars Reserve in Ecuador. The reserve is actually located on the Pacific side of the Andes Mountains in the cloud forest and not on the Eastern Amazonian side in the Andes as I wrote in my pre-meeting email announcement. Please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Rue Vandegrift. Thanks everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Thanks Tom for that lovely introduction. Here, let me uh, get my presentation up here. So uh, Richer Than Gold um, is the title of our, of our project. This is an ongoing project to study the fungal biodiversity of this threatened Andean cloud forest reserve. Uh, so today I, I would like to take you on a journey uh, into the forests of Reserva Los Cedros and, uh, and you know, similar surrounding habitats. Um, and I think as we, as we move forward, it will quickly become obvious why the project is called Richer Than Gold. Um, so Los Cedros Reserve, you can see on the map here, uh, is about 60 kilometers north and a little bit west from Quito. Um, so you can see the spine of the Andes in this map right here. Uh, it protects about 7,000 hectares of primary neotropical cloud forest. And for, uh, this is all in metric, um, because I'm a scientist and also because this presentation was first given in Ecuador. Uh, but for anybody who is struggling with the conversion, um, a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters uh, on a side. It's a big square. Uh, two, what is it? Two point, well, see now I'm forgetting. Uh, two, two, two point two something. And acres. Two and a half acres. There you go. Two and a half acres uh, per hectare. Uh, so this is primary neotropical cloud forest, which means it's never been logged. It's never been cleared. Uh, the elevation range for Los Cedros is about 11, 1,100 meters to 2,700 meters. Uh, so, you know, you can say roughly uh, 3,000 to uh, 8,000 feet. Uh, and importantly, uh, it shares a border with this huge ecological preserve called the Cotacachi Cayapas, which is this sort of globally significant reserve um, that's a different class of protected lands in Ecuador. Uh, and so we have this, it, it, Los Cedros functions as part of the buffer zone around this giant ecological preserve. Um, Ecuador, pardon me, um, Los Cedros protects uh, primary cloud forest. And so this is the forest within the cloud condensation zone in the mountains. Um, so this is an extremely endangered ecosystem. The Amazonian rainforest, uh, by comparison, is much better protected. This kind of forest in Ecuador, there's only three or four percent left. And it's very difficult to get to. So to, to get to Los Cedros, uh, you take a bus from Quito to the nearest town, a place called Chantal, uh, where you hire a truck. The truck takes you literally to the end of the road, about an hour drive from there, where you meet the mules coming down from the reserve. Bundle everything up onto the mules, um, and it's about a three hour hike with the mules to get up to the research station at Los Cedros. It used to be longer. The, the road gets closer and closer to the reserve every year, um, and that affects the protection of this reserve. You see the, the remoteness of Los Cedros, how difficult it is to access, uh, is part of why it's so well protected. It's part of why it's one of the only places in all of Ecuador where you can find all three species of monkey that occur on the western side of the Andes. Um, 
the, so this is a howler monkey that we're looking, or no, this is a brown-headed spider monkey, one of the most critically endangered monkeys on the planet and the most endangered monkey in all of Ecuador. Uh, it can be found in three places, including Los Cedros in Ecuador. Uh, it's why there are uh, at least six species of large cat at the reserve, including this ocelot. Um, the bird diversity is absolutely um, off the charts. There are more than 300 species of bird known from Los Cedros alone. Um, and the orchid diversity uh, will blow your mind. There are more than 400 species of orchid at Los Cedros, this little tiny protected forest. Uh, and, and all of this incredible diversity uh, is really due to the fact that this is a really difficult place to get to. So the human impacts have been pretty minimal. And that of course goes for the fungal diversity as well. Um, so what we're looking at here, uh, this, this first one is a gliocephala, uh, which despite what you might think is not an ascomycete, this is a gillless mushroom closely related to marasmius. Uh, this is a hygrosibi, a waxy cap, uh, probably an undescribed species. So we're still working on that. Um, this is an ascomycete called xylobotrium, uh, which was recently is so unique, it's been given its own class, the xylobotriomyces. Uh, and of course, this final mushroom is a mycena, a very tiny mycena um, with this brilliant green color. This is also likely an undescribed species. So when we're working in this forest, we come across species that are, that are undescribed uh, basically every day. It's incredible. And so when we're, I wanna start kind of thinking about biodiversity at Los Cedros with a quote. Um, so this guy, Sir Robert Watson, uh, said in an interview that high level political attention on the environment has been focused largely on climate change because energy policy is central to economic growth. But biodiversity is just as important for the future of the earth as climate change. Right? We're, we're dealing with multiple issues at the same time. Now, Robert Watson uh, is the head of the, international, the Intergovernmental Panel uh, for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which I realize is not as catchy of a name as, as the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, but same idea, one of these big UN collaborative groups. Um, and so, you know, we focus, political attention gets focused on climate change, um, right? And this is true. You, you probably all recognize this young woman, Greta Thunberg, uh, who has kind of spearheaded the student protest movement about climate change. Um, this is a, a photograph from uh, protests last year in London. Um, closer to, to, to my home, um, this is the group of, children's, of children from our Children's Trust who are suing the US federal government over climate change uh, right here in Eugene, Oregon, where, where I live. Uh, I actually am friends with the lawyer on this, uh, on this crew. Um, but so I wanna, I wanna think for a little bit about this idea though, that biodiversity is just as important for the future of the earth as climate change, right? We're not just changing the climate of the planet, we are also, as a species, responsible for the sixth great mass extinction. It's related to climate change, but it's not all climate change. And so if we're gonna think about biodiversity and the impact on the planet, the future of the planet, we need to define some terms. What is biodiversity? And I think when most of us think of biodiversity, we think of something like this. Uh, this is a selection of orchids at Los Cedros. So each of these little squares is an individual orchid species. Uh, it's just some of the incredible diversity of orchids at Los Cedros. And so this is what we think of. We think of species diversity, the number and abundance of species present in different communities, right? But species diversity is related to genetic diversity, the variety of genetic material within a species or population, what genes are present in that population. And of course, genetic diversity is related to this idea of functional diversity. What functions do those genes code for? Uh, you know, carbon degradation, carbon storage, uh, nutrient cycling, energy flows, uh, you know, the creation of air and water, right? And then all of that goes into ecological diversity, right? The variety of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems in a particular area, right? You know, we can think of ecosystems on this very small scales or we can think of ecosystems on these very large scales. 
And all of these kinds of diversity, all of this, this ways of thinking about diversity is really important because it ties in with this idea of ecosystem services, right? What services do ecosystems provide us? Uh, things like flood water control, water purification, uh, air to breathe, uh, wood for building materials. Uh, pollination is a great example of an ecosystem service that we take for granted for the most part. I, I don't know about you guys, but I like to garden. Um, and I, you know, I think about pollination and that I plant particular plants to attract pollinators. Um, or, you know, there are a handful of things, uh, corn, for example, that you hand pollinate. But, you know, for the most part, when you think of global food systems, we think of pollination as something that just happens, at least most people do. But pollination of crops worldwide is estimated to be worth something like $577 billion. It's a huge amount of money. And that's annually. That's how much it would cost if you had to pay somebody to pollinate all your crops. Which brings us back to Ecuador. Uh, this is a global map of plant diversity the world over. Uh, the more red and the darker the color, the higher the diversity. You can see Ecuador here sits in one of the most biodiverse zones on the planet. It is per square mile, the most biodiverse country on the face of the earth. It's why um, something like 16% of the plants in the world are known from Ecuador. Uh, you know, 10% of all the birds in the world are known from Ecuador, including this endemic Choco Tucan. 7% um, of all the amphibians on the planet are known from Ecuador. And 7% of all the mammals on the planet are known from Ecuador, including this endangered white-faced capuchin monkey. Um, and all of these photographs are from Los Cedros. And preserving that biodiversity, protecting that biodiversity um, it, it is complicated and is important. And traditionally, the, the threat to the biodiversity at Los Cedros um, has looked like this. People build roads, it's something that people do. We've always done that. Um, and as the population of Ecuador has increased and as globalization has tied Ecuador more kind of into westernized industrial economies, uh, the roads have pushed farther and farther into these untouched forests. Uh, so like we said, Los Cedros, every year, the road gets a little closer and the hike to Los Cedros gets a little shorter. New roads open up land for exploitation. And the first thing to go are the trees. Uh, selective logging, typically by hand with a chainsaw and a mule train uh, is, you know, just an, a, a, an incredibly lucrative way for people in one of the poorest parts of the world uh, to put, you know, to bring in some money and put some food on their family's tables. Um, and so as the roads get pushed further into the forest, it allows greater access for this kind of selective logging. Uh, and also I'd like to take just a moment to think about these are wet milled, chainsaw milled boards, about four by 12s. Each mule is carrying four to eight of them. Uh, each of these mules is carrying something like 800 pounds of wet lumber. Uh, the mules work harder than anybody in this climate. And then of course, um, when the selective logging is through, the forests are thinned out, which opens it up for further colonization and exploitation. Uh, in particular, clearing for cattle pasture. Uh, there are actually more cows in Ecuador than there are people. It's one of the largest segments of the Ecuadorian economy, uh, which is why the graffiti artist M.S. says that he paints cows on everything because he wants to represent that there are more cows than there are people in Ecuador. Uh, and of course, once those lands have been cleared for pasture, uh, there is a need to get the meat and the dairy products to market, which leads to more road building. And this slow march of agricultural progress, agricultural development, has been the, the threat at Los Cedros uh, for decades. And this has been what the people who have been involved in conserving this protected forest uh, have been concerned with, with their, their activist activities, their community building, um, you know, the, the way they approach conservation at Los Cedros. Uh, but that has changed recently. Um, there's a new threat to Los Cedros and to these protected forests in Ecuador. Mega mining has come to Ecuador. In the last couple of years uh, has seen just an absolute giant increase in the amount of land available to mining. Uh, and so for scale, this is a, a gold mine in Australia 
uh, that is the style of mine that is being proposed for Los Cedros and the surrounding areas. Um, you can see these vehicles, uh, you know, these are these huge earth moving vehicles with wheels taller than I am. You know, these are, these are, each one of these is the equivalent of a, you know, one of these big semi truck sized creatures. This, this is a, an open pit mine that is more than a kilometer deep. And so uh, the mining concessions that were available in Ecuador um, as of July 2017 uh, covered a relatively small percentage of the country. There were a couple of mining projects in development in the south um, and not much else going on for mining. It's the only Andean nation that hasn't had mega mining, right? Colombia to the north uh, and Peru to the south, Bolivia uh, have all had these huge mega mining projects. Ecuador has not historically. In August of 2017, there was a policy change within the government of Ecuador that changed the amount of land available for mining from this to this. 300% increase in the amount of land available to the mining sector. Um, and of course, that has led to some pretty wide widespread protests. Uh, in, in particular, a large number of those concessions uh, were on indigenous land. Uh, and so there have been incredible marches, uh, organized marches, multiple tribes. Um, they, there was a sit-in on the president's lawn. And some of those concessions have been revoked, but without formal process, there's never been an explanation of where did the money go? Uh, there's never been an explanation uh, for the people of um, what companies involved, and most of these companies uh, that had bought the rights to these mining concessions on indigenous territory are still active, even though the concessions, some of those concessions have been revoked. Um, it's almost like the government has told the people that the mining concessions have been revoked, but they haven't told the companies. Um, and, you know, mining on this scale in areas like this is not gentle on the landscape. You might recall uh, in 2019, the, the disaster in Minas Gerais in Brazil, where a, a mining tailings pond burst um, and you know, millions of cubic meters of toxic sludge flooded into the river. Uh, 200 plus people died instantly in the disaster and millions more are at risk of death from contamination of the waterways and the, the effects to the fishing industry, water for drinking, et cetera. Um, so, so this really concerned us as a, as a group of scientists. Uh, so we came together, uh, from those of us from the University of Oregon, with a nonprofit in Australia called the Rainforest Information Center and a mining observatory group in Ecuador called Omazne. Um, to really like study this boom in mining concessions. And so we, we had to get um, GIS data through a leak in the government. They don't, they, they explicitly do not provide the data for the, the, these new mining concessions. Um, so, so we obtained this data, um, uh, Amazne obtained this data actually. Um, and, and we wrote this very rapidly. We wrote this report on the extent of these recent mining concessions in Ecuador and the way uh, analyzing the way that they overlap with conservation priorities, protected forests, indigenous zones, um, et cetera. Um, and because you know this is so important, uh, we made sure that this was available in both English and Spanish. Um, if anybody wants a copy, I'm perfectly happy to send it out. Um, it, it's freely available, um, easy to find. Uh, and we found, you know, we found a number of troubling things. Uh, the big one, of course, being the way that these new mining concessions uh, overlapped with uh, the class of protected forests called bosques protectores. Um, before this, the announcement of these new mining concessions in 2017, uh, zero bosques protectores were under mining concession. After these new concessions were announced, about a third of the nation's network of protected forests was under mining concession, uh, including Los Cedros, which is this little red blip right here. Um, and you, you, you can notice this big sh shadow right here. This is the Cotacachi Cayapas Ecological Preserve. That class of protected forest has, has remained protected, um, but you can see that it's absolutely surrounded by mining concessions now, which is not great in, from a conservation standpoint. 
Uh, and so here's a close up. You can see Cotacachi Chiapas is still protected. Uh, Los Cedros, however, is now two thirds under mining concession to a Canadian mining company called Cornerstone Capital Resources. Uh, whole villages have been you know, subsumed by mining concessions. Uh, the, it's, it's absolutely incredible um, what has happened. And the, the mining companies will tell you that, you know, oh, well, these are just exploratory concessions. The process of exploration, you know, doesn't mean, you know, only one in, you know, one in a hundred mining concessions will lead to a mine. But this is mining exploration. This is a photograph of mining exploration in the nearby Junin protected forest right next door to Los Cedros. Uh, to, to do this exploration for minerals, you have to cut deep into the subsoil so that you can take samples and sort of figure out what minerals are there. And to do that requires heavy machinery, which requires building roads into these undisturbed pristine habitats. And we know the effect that road building has on the protections of these forests, right? It, it, it opens those forests up for exploitation. Even if a mine is not opened, simply the act of exploration, this building roads and cutting into the subtoil can lead to incredible water contamination. Uh, and it, you know, the most important thing is it opens these areas up uh, for selective logging and clearing for cattle pasture. And you know, the other thing we found that was really concerning was the way that these new mining concessions overlapped with this cloud forest zone. You know, this zone, right, where the clouds come up the mountains and then condense, that elevation line is extremely important for the hydrological cycle. It actually serves as the water source for most of the major rivers in Ecuador, this cloud forest zone. And the majority of these mining concessions are in this zone. And it's particularly troubling because this has been a zone that has already been incredibly hard hit by human environmental land use change. Um, there's only three or 4% of this kind of Choco rainforest left in all of Ecuador. It's been incredibly hard hit by human activities. And the potential for water contamination uh, that could affect hundreds of thousands or millions of people downstream uh, is, it can't be understated. So this is actually a photograph of that dam collapse in Brazil, which is in relatively similar habitat. Um, you know, this, this rain, mountainous rainforest landscape. And the way these mining companies build these tailing dams uh, is, is part of the problem here, right? Uh, so the mining company, you know, they don't really know precisely how much mineral is in the ground that they're gonna be able to extract. And they don't wanna invest any more money than they have to in the infrastructure to remove those minerals, right? They're on, they're, they're on a for-profit basis. So they build these dams in layers. They take a layer of compacted mud to build a dam to hold the water that is used to process the ore, which is laden with mercury and arsenic and cyanide and you know, chromium and cadmium and zinc, all you know, this, the heavy metal contamination and the, you know, the, the other forms of contamination that is in these tailing ponds cannot be understated. This is a pond full of toxic sludge. That's the product of mining. And then when it gets full, if there's still you know, production happening in the mine, they just add a layer, a new layer of compacted mud to the dam, and then they fill it with more water. And then they add another layer and they fill it with more water, so long as the mine continues to be productive. And that what that leads to is a dam that has never been engineered to hold back the amount of liquid on the other side of it. And then when you think about building this kind of dam in a place like Los Cedros, you have to consider that at Los Cedros, it rains four meters, 12 feet every year. And the return rate for magnitude seven earthquakes or greater is about once a decade. Uh, Steve, Steve Reich, who's a mining engineer in Utah, um, has said that it is absolutely irresponsible to engage in this style of mining in this part of Ecuador, uh, because there is no way that a tailings dam can ever be secure in this habitat. 
Uh, and so, so what do we do about this? Oh, this one still has Spanish on it. Uh, so más rico que oro is the same as richer than gold. Um, and so, so, you know, this is a huge, it's a huge thing. Um, this expansion of mining across Ecuador. Um, and so, so we organized this richer than gold, multidisciplinary international expedition up into the heart of Los Cedros as a specific response to the granting of mining concessions uh, at Los Cedros. And this, is, this isn't everybody on the crew, but this is the largest we had in camp at any particular moment. Uh, the seed funding came from National Geographic um, and the expedition was um, engaged with the, the collaboration of INABIO, the Institute, the National Institute of Biodiversity in Ecuador. Uh, and we had uh, partial funding from the American Orchid Society as well for the botany side of it. Uh, and so we went to the headwaters of the Los Cedros River, uh, which is at an elevation, about 2000 meters elevation. It's a part of the reserve that has never been explored for fungi, for plants, for orchids, for herps, for birds. Uh, it's just an incredible, you know, deep in the reserve. Nobody's ever been there before. It was really incredible to get up there. But we're in a place where it rains four meters a year. Uh, and lots of rain and steep landscapes mean mud. This is my colleague Dan Thomas, literally knee deep in mud on our access trail. So from, you know, I told you how you get to the research station at Los Cedros. From the research station, this was eight hours further distant, hiking along a path that looked like this. <laughs> not even, not, oops, oh, come on. I have this cute little video. Uh, not, even, not even the mules uh, liked these trails. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. Uh, and part of the reason that these trails were, were difficult is because we actually didn't build this trail. Uh, this was a trail cut by the mining company uh, illegally prospecting within the reserve. It is very clear in Ecuadorian law that mining prospecting and mining activities are not allowed within Bosques Protectores. Uh, the mining company has disputed that um, and has gone in, cut trails, cleared sites anyway. So we used their trails and we used the site that they had cleared for their prospecting for our expedition to make the data we collected all the more valuable for the conservation of Los Cedros. Uh, and you can see this guy here is uh, Martin, is one of the parabiologists and uh, it's kind of like a, uh, a park ranger for Los Cedros. He's worked there for decades uh, and he is a beast. It took me and everybody else eight hours to hike this trail. Uh, he goes back and forth with the mules uh, twice a day. It takes him about three hours to get from the station up to the research camp because he's a beast. <laughs> So this is our camp. We built this camp in the middle of the rainforest. We had to terrace the mud to have spots to pitch our tents. Um, and, you know, it's wet. The only, the primary issue with doing anything in this climate is that it's wet. Um, and so this is my tent. Um, you can see the clothes attempting to dry. They never dried. Um, you spend your life in rubber boots. Uh, but the view kind of makes it worth it. You know, we spent, um, all told, I think seven weeks um, camped at this field camp uh, deep in the rainforest, and it was incredible. Um, and we couldn't have done it without the support of INABIO, the National Institute of Biodiversity in Ecuador. And so this is Rosa Batallas. Rosa Batallas is the curator of fungi at the National Herbarium in Quito. Um, and so she was part of our expedition. She actually uh, did that hike with us and stayed with us for almost a month up at that field camp. Uh, she specializes in gastromycetes and puffballs. Uh, this is the mycological laboratory. <laughs> it's part of our, uh, part of our expedition. Uh, and like I said, the primary concern is keeping things dry. So we have a little gas generator, which is up underneath of this uh, tarp over here, uh, which powers mostly uh, a small low energy dehydrator. Uh, so, you know, you go out, you collect specimens, um, you have to preserve them. And so everything gets dehydrated. Um, and then we have these uh, gasketed snap lock Tupperware that are full of silica gel. This big white five gallon bucket is actually five gallons, 25 pounds of silica gel, which it turns out you can't get in Ecuador. We had to bring the silica gel from the United States. Uh, and between the mycology crew, um, who brought 25 pounds and the botany crew who brought 50 pounds of silica gel. We imported 150 pounds of silica gel and then carted it up the mountain deep into the rainforest. 
Um, and of course, the pelican cases here are airtight um, and also have silica gel at the bottom, are used for sample storage and for equipment storage to make sure everything stays dry. Uh, you know, you have to put your computer, anything you're logging data on, camera equipment, it all goes in there at, at nighttime to just dry out. Just using equipment, electronical, electrical equipment in these conditions uh, is hard on the equipment. So everything, our, our day to day, uh, basically we, we went out, we were collecting samples uh, in a, an organized fashion, what's called a modified gentry plot, uh, co-collecting with the botanists so that we have plant data and fungal data that can, that can work together. Um, and then everything gets documented very carefully with uh, you know, field photography, uh, which is difficult because it's pouring rain all the time. Uh, we, so like I said, we were, we were up there for um, like seven weeks, I think. Uh, it rained more than a meter on us in that time. <laughs> it was very, very rainy. Um, and so this is a, this is a hypocreolian fungus on a bamboo leaf that's unidentified and probably undescribed. Um, up here, actually, this is a, a known fungus, a really interesting one. This is Ascopoliparus polychroas. It's a parasite of bamboo. So you can see one here on the bamboo comb here. Uh, but it's a parasite of bamboo in a very interesting way. Uh, it, it actually is related to cordyceps and it infects a tiny, tiny scale insect. And it eats the entire scale insect except for its mouth parts. It leaves the mouth parts stuck in the bamboo and uses them like a straw to pull nutrients out of the bamboo and grows to hundreds of times the size of the scale insect it initially infected. Uh, and it's called polychroas, is the species epithet, uh, because of the incredible array of colors. Uh, and you can see here in the center, this is where the little scale insect would have been. It's been completely digested. Um, similarly, uh, these, these kind of hypercreolian, um, cordicipitaceous looking uh, fungi on bamboo is kind of a a really interesting group of fungi. And so this is a species of monkia. This is an asexual fungus. You can see here the sporodokia where the asexual spores are produced. Um, and monkey is really interesting uh, because it, it right now it doesn't have a known sexual morph, uh, you know, a, 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 a teleomorph you, you call it. But there's been suspicion for a really long time that this other fungus called mycomalus which is sexual, you can see the parathesia here where the sexual spores are produced, um, might maybe be the, you know, the sexual form of monkia. People have been thinking about that for a hundred years, but it has been complicated by the fact that mycomalis has only been known from the type specimen collected in Brazil 125 years ago. And you can see here the remains of those sporodokia from the monkia. And what you can't see in these photographs is that this comb of bamboo is the same comb as this one. So we've got them on the same host, we've got intermediate features, uh, we're still working on the genetic data, but these collections pretty much prove that mycomalis is the sexual form of monkia. It's an anamorph teleomorph connection that has been speculated about in the literature for a hundred years. Um, and so here's the original, these are the original plates describing uh, mycomalis. It was described by Alfred Mueller. Uh, Alfred Mueller is actually best known as a biographer of Fritz Mueller, who was a prominent Darwinist uh, and for which Mullerian mimicry is described. So he was uh, Mueller's biographer, but Mueller here is actually a, an excellent um, mycologist in his own right. And interestingly, in addition to this paper describing mycomalis, um, and again, this is a fungus that up until this collection was only known from this type specimen. Uh, this is also the same publication where he described Ascopoliparus polychroas. And so we've got both of these things from his initial publication uh, at this one site in Ecuador. And of course, some of the stars of the show uh, were the spider associated cordyceps fungus. So the cordyceps nidus group grows on trapdoor spiders, um, other large spiders. Uh, so this is the body of the spider. It's the same, same here. And you can see the fungus actually extends from the fruiting body of the fungus, extends, extends from the body of the fungus, and up here is where the parathesia are on this side. Um, and this, about from the spider to the end of the fruiting body, is about nine inches. This is a giant fungus. Um, this is a smaller spider-associated cordicipitaceous fungus, Gibellula, it's asexual phase. Um, 
this is only about a centimeter long, the whole spider. You can see its legs sticking out here and the spores all clustered on these, uh, what are called, um, uh, I just forgot the name of the aggregated anamorphic structure. Anyway, uh, you know, they're producing spores in these like, club-like projections. Uh, what's really interesting about this particular specimen is not so much what it is, but where it was found. Um, we actually had a crew of trained arborists collect, you know, surveying the, the upper canopy of these trees. And this little spider associated fungus was collected 30 meters off the ground as part of one of these aerial surveys. So we had all kinds of interesting fungal collections uh, from this trip. Uh, some of the most interesting things, however, were these red listed fungi. So, you know, you've probably heard of the IUCN red list. This is the list of endangered species. Um, the fungal red list is a much newer initiative. There are very, very few fungi that have been studied well enough to uh, be under consideration for this fungal red list. And we find four of them at Los Cedros. Um, so Lamelliporus americanus, which has sideways gills, is very interesting, uh, very recognizable. Um, Thamnomyces chocoensis is a, a choco endemic. So that's this western slope of the Andes cloud forest zone. That's uh, only known from this habitat. Uh, Hygrosopy aphyla, a gillless Hygrosopy, um, and Callistoderma uh, arantium here. So these are four red list fungi known from Los Cedros. And of course, the fungal diversity at Los Cedros extends to Xylaria as well. I, I'm a Xylariologist, I study Xylaria. Um, and so we've actually documented something like 50 species of Xylaria from Ecuador. Um, an incredible array of form uh, and function. Uh, you know, the, there are globally something like four or 500 species of Xylaria in the world. Uh, and so 50 species just known from Los Cedros is an extremely significant percentage of the global diversity of this genus. So all told, you know, this richer than gold um, project, uh, it's not just this one expedition. This one expedition was really kind of like what made it cohesive, but uh, we've actually been working on the biodiversity of fungi from Los Cedros for much longer. There've been six different collecting trips um, from 2008 to 2018. Uh, it's an ongoing project. We've got lots of publications in the works, including a, a large checklist paper, some Xylaria systematics, uh, some other Ascomycete systematics. We've got this just huge array of collaborators for particular taxonomic groups. It's very exciting. Um, and yeah, and this network is continuing to grow. So if you know any specialists uh, who are interested in working on Ecuadorian material, um, uh, please put me in touch uh, because there's always room for, for more people to help with this project. Um, and so right now, from these six collecting trips, we have 1,742 collections representing almost 300 different genera. Uh, and I'm presenting the data here at the genus level because so many of these species are uh, poorly studied um, or undescribed that we don't actually have a really good handle uh, on how many particular species we have, because they're just, you know, it takes specialists to identify these things. Uh, and the specialists are rare and the fungi are rare. Um, and, you know, we're, it's, yeah, it gets really complicated really fast, you can imagine. Uh, but the genus, you know, the genera, the number of genus that are present, uh, we have a much better handle on. Uh, and here's the diversity from the order level. You can see that you know, these 300 genera span an enormous number of different orders, but we have two that are really overrepresented, the Agaricales and the Xylariales. And this is a, a factor uh, related to who has been doing the collecting. Because I, of course, work on Xylaria and, and related fungi. Uh, and so the, the reason we have, you know, a disproportionate number of Xylariales uh, is because of the collecting trips that I have been involved with. For the Agaricales, uh, Bryn Dentinger, uh, who was for a little while the lead mycologist at Kew Gardens in London and is now at Utah, um, he was involved in these early collecting trips and he had a, a real special interest in uh, mycinoid kind of fungi, these white agaricoids. So uh, we've got this overrepresentation of Agaricales. But you know, we've never had a specialist out uh, who works with 
Pizizales, like little cup fungi. Uh, we've never had a specialist out who works on crust fungi, um, corticoid fungi, uh, cantharelloid fungi. So, you know, there's this there's this huge possibility uh, that as we get more specialists to come out and collect at Los Cedros, uh, this diversity is just going to rise, you know, through the roof. Uh, because who's collecting what that search image is that they have makes a huge difference on what you actually find. And of course, all of these collections go to enrich the, the National Herbarium in Quito. I've spent a lot of time now uh, curating, uh, helping with identifications and organization, uh, and you know, all the general things you do with curation at the National Herbarium in Quito. All of our collections are split. So one voucher stays in Ecuador at the National Herbarium in Quito, and one the other voucher gets deposited um, at uh, OSU here in Oregon. Um, or a couple of other places, depending on who's the collaborator. Uh, but always, you know, and this is, I think this is really important. When working in developing countries, it is absolutely essential that the, the, the wealth of the biodiversity that is there stays with that country. There's a long history of scientists um, functioning as just another form of extractive industry for developing countries like Ecuador. Um, and you know, I think it's really important that as, as scientists, as mycologists, uh, that we take a really active role in um, breaking that cycle and working specifically you know, with Ecuadorian collabor collaborators, uh, with Ecuadorian institutions to strengthen and improve those institutions and not just extract the biological wealth for our own uh, benefit. Um, and so you know, there's lots of people who've been involved in all of this work. Um, you know, everybody from Los Cedros. Uh, one thing that's I think really important to say uh, for thanks is that most of my funding through the years has come from small clubs like you guys, the Cascade Mycological Society, Sonoma County Mycological Society, the Oregon Mycological Society have all helped fund this work. Um, and of course, everybody on the expedition um, goes without saying deserves thanks. Um, it was an incredible experience. Uh, we, you know, we collected more than 300 um, uh, good vouchered fungal collections um, and we're still processing and working through all that data. Uh, but particularly our Ecuadorian mycology collaborators, Jorge Flores here, um, uh, Nelson Duenas, who's not in the picture, uh, Rosa Batayos, the curator of the uh, herbarium, uh, Elisa Levy, who's the research coordinator for Los Cedros, uh, and Martino Blando, who's the, uh, one of the, uh, the park rangers at Los Cedros, the parabiologists. Um, and then the tree climbing crew, Aaron Nelson was the one who found that spider. Um, Sarah Ward, Dan Thomas were involved in the tree climbing crew. Uh, it was just, what a great, what a great crew. Um, oh, and I, I should mention uh, Danny Newman, whose photographs um, many of you probably are aware of and have seen throughout this presentation. Uh, and of course, we couldn't have done it without the mules. Um, the mules played a huge role here. Uh, and, you know, the one of the groups of people that I, I can't thank enough uh, is the film crew. Uh, so, so like you heard, we're, we're making a documentary um, focusing on this expedition. Um, here, I've got a little reel. I can show you some footage. Um, so we're making a documentary that's focusing on this expedition and the biodiversity at Los Cedros, as well as um, this mining conservation issue in Ecuador, focusing kind of specifically on um, the effects that this mining expansion uh, has on the lives of rural and indigenous women. And so we're working with surrounding cum communities, uh, the Awa indigenous group um, in Northern Ecuador to, to really try to tell this story with a lot of compassion and nuance. Um, Cause it's, you know, it's not, it's not just as simple as mining is bad. Um, and, and conservation is good, right? Like these are people's livelihoods at stake. Um, and these are people who feel like they don't have any other options. Uh, and so, so we're working on this movie. I'm actually leaving to go back to Ecuador tomorrow uh, to finish filming uh, for this film. Um, we've had two successful Kickstarter crowdfunding uh, runs. Uh, this is actually some of this footage that you're seeing here is the, uh, the El Corazon mine, which is right outside the border of Los Cedros. Um, this, these are the, this is the Waroni protest. Um, you know, it's just, it's been an incredible experience uh, throughout. Um, and yeah, with that, I, I'll take any questions. Elizabeth, you got anything in the chat room? Yeah, the, the one thing that you didn't uh, cover that someone asked early on was um, 
how much indigenous use is there of the Los Cedros area? Um, like, is it inhabited lightly, traditionally without roads or is there just no one there? That's a great question. No, Los Cedros, um, there is a history, um, I'm gonna kill the slides for the moment. There is a history of um, indigenous uh, habitation in the Los Cedros area um, that ended sometime during the conquistador era as, as close as we can figure. Um, and, you know, there's, if you, you know, when we, we've got like these, you know, the, res, the research station um, and you can, if you look along the drip lines where the, where the rain like creates kind of a, a, a line in the mud where you, it digs down a little bit, you can find shards of pottery or, um, you know, uh, spearheads or little, you know, little pieces of evidence that there have been people uh, in that watershed, you know, over some, you know, over the last millennium sometime. Um, there, as far as I know, there hasn't been any really detailed archaeological work done at Los, at Los Cedros. It's kind of a, um, a potentially open uh, avenue of research. Uh, but there haven't, there haven't been people at Los Cedros for at least the last several hundred years. Uh, so when we, when we went up to the headwaters of the Los Cedros River, um, other than the miners who were there ahead of us, who cleared the spot where we built our camp, um, that was probably the first time people had been up there in several hundred years. That's pretty cool. Kelly right. wants to know, do you get to name the mushrooms that you find if they're <laughs> undescribed? Yeah, um, yes, but it's a long and complicated process. And I, I actually, we haven't, we haven't named any new ones uh, yet. We've got a couple in process. Um, I do have a paper coming out um, very soon in Northeastern Naturalist dealing with uh, fungi from the Boston Harbor Islands, uh, where I do name a new species discovered in the Boston Harbor Islands. Uh, and you can do, you know, the, there's all kinds of the rules, the, the rules for naming new species um, is a, a, a bookshelf worth of books. It's an incredible set of rules um, that you have to follow. One of them is you can't name things after yourself, which is another question I get all the time, you name something after yourself. Um, so probably when we when we do name some of these new fungi from Los Cedros, um, you know things like right now there's a there's a frog that's recently described that's uh, Prismatus cedros that's you know named for Los Cedros. There's a there's another amphibian um, that's named Decuii because uh, Jose Decu is the founder and manager of the Los Cedros Research Station. Um, so I, I will probably name a fungus after Jose as well. Um, I like to name things for places. The, the one from the Boston Harbor Islands uh, comes from a peninsula called World's End. So the fungus is called Finis Mundoensis, the, the, from the end of the world. Um, so, you know, you get to have fun with, with naming, but uh, it's not as exciting of a part of it as you might expect because it's such a long process to, to write up and publish a, a new species. And our other speaker tonight, William Davis, wanted to know if you've been documenting um, downy mildew. Um, downy mildew, so like, like oomycetes? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, do we have any downy mildew collections? You know, I don't, we definitely haven't had any oomycete specialists up there. Um, there might be one or two in the 1700 plus collections, but I can't, think of any off the top. I know we have powdery mildews that we've documented. There was a little, uh, we've got a little paper in the works on the powdery mildews from Los Cedros, um, of which most are undescribed as you might expect. Uh, but uh, downy mildews, no. Uh, so if you if you want to come to Los Cedros, uh, you should definitely, let's, let's talk now. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to rip me in. <laughs> You're shaking your head. Um, that's great. That's, that's um, all the questions we had from the chat. All right, we should probably move on. Thanks very much. That was a, um, a very, uh, beyond uh, any comprehensive way to describe it, uh, tour through the rainforest. So thank you, Rue. Appreciate it very much.